And I will use this as the opportunity to say this won't be a sophisticated production this morning, <laughs> but it will be passionate, absolutely. And I'm going to hold my remarks to a minimum because you get to hear me all the time. And we have special guests here this morning. We've got to line up both first and second service, and you may want to stay for second service too so you can hear the other five missionaries that we have who will be with us. We've got 18 international partners that we connect with financially, prayerfully. Sometimes we go visit them. But this week is the International Conference on Missions, and so many of our partners are here with us in town. So it's your opportunity to hear them and understand that these aren't our imaginary friends that we talk about all the time. They are real people flesh in the flesh and with us here today. So they have each got 10 minutes to inflame you with passion for God's work. And I, I don't mean to be flippant about that, but these are, are wonderful people and good friends. And so I will be quiet, as I said I would, and bring them up and let them share with you. First up is Larry and Diana Owen. They are with Waves of Mercy Mission in port de Pay, Haiti. And I suppose that if I were to name somebody that had the biggest effect on me as far as um, understanding what mission work is all about, uh, it's Larry and Diana. So we're going to roll tape on a little introductory video, and then uh, you all can share. So it's coming. may be medicated, but I'm dedicated. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to be here when, in, and to serve with Bartman. We did a lot of good things in Haiti. And in spite of that, we, we still survived over there, and the mission is growing. But I want to just say something about being excited and passionate. I want everybody to feel the, the power of God that's in his word. Sometimes we read it. Sometimes we study it. We forget actually what this book is and what our Father in heaven is that Jesus Christ died for us. And I've always been drawn to, to crazy people. I guess that's why Bart and I get along so well together. <laughs> but I've always been drawn to, to crazy people, people in need, and be able to reach out and help, and help them. I think that comes from Mama. We had one soup, bottle, soup bone in, in the hollow of West Virginia. And we'd pass it around until somebody made something out of it they shouldn't make, and we couldn't use the bone no more to make our soup. What I'm trying to tell you is I'm a nobody that comes from the hills of West Virginia, but I know my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I know that the gift that he gives you and the call that he gives you is non-revocable. It's impossible. 
I'm sometimes when I get myself in a real jam because of stupidity of somebody else or the stupidity of me, I fall back upon that passage of Scripture that I know my Father in heaven is never surprised at anything that we say or we do. He knows it. He's ahead of us, isn't it? And we look at this Scripture, and it just comes to life. I look for him every day. What do you look for? The doctor's phone number or whatever it is, it's got to be down. But my Father in heaven loves us, and he put it in this book. I can remember the first thing when I really did something I thought was significant back when I was about oh, in the second grade. I got it in my mind. I wanted my own copy of God's Word. And we had those old nickel tablets back then. They had Cochise on the front of them or Hopalong Cassidy or something. When you opened up the, the leaflet inside the paper, it was kind of a greenish cast. looked like it had flecks of wood inside of it. Uh, anyways. I wanted to make my own copy of God's Word, and I started copying it up in the hills of West Virginia, just so in love with it. I don't know why. I was fascinated by it. So I was making my own copy, but I was using up those tablets. And Mama come to me and said, what are you doing? I said, I'm copying God's Word. She said, you already got a copy. I go, no, no, Mama, you don't understand. I, I, I want my own copy. I want to make it, underline different things. That was as a young boy. Mama said, Larry, I'm sorry, but... We don't have the money for you to do that, to buy the pads. So I gave up on that. But I've always felt close to my Father in heaven. And I just want, I want you to feel that, that passion. Passion is something that's, you, you can't teach people to be passionate or enthusiastic for what we're doing. It's, it's something that's caught, not taught. And some along the line, my family and I, when we dedicated our life to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I was baptized in the West Fork River in West Virginia. I went in under the family plan. My dad and three sisters were baptized with me. I can remember you think, what well, holy thought did I have? I went home and I was riding in the back seat of the car and I go, Dad, it's not fair. He goes, what's not fair, son? I said that you're 40 some years old and, and you've had all those years to do what you want to do. I'm nine years old and I gotta start being good. That don't seem right. <laughs> I'm gonna let my wife do some speaking, but I just, I just, I just want you to know, I'm 73 years old, and I finally reached the place where I don't care what you think. <laughs> I don't. I'm a free man. I can do, you know, I, the, I don't, maybe I shouldn't say this, but, but sometimes when I was in the located mist, we had an old man walk down the street. He'd get to our church, and he, we were at the corner of 4th and Main, and he'd haul it out and went down the corner of the church. I thought, how detestable. Here I am doing the same thing. I'll try not to do it up here in front of you. Here's Mama. <laughs> well, bonjour, y'all. Bonjour. <clears throat> That's the way I, I speak Creole. I have a new language in, in Haiti I call Creelish. With my southern accent, I'm the only one that has to have two interpreters, one into, from Kentucky <clears throat> to English and then from English on into Creole. So <laughs> I hope you can understand me. <laughs> It has been such a joy to be in Haiti. And Larry and I are just as excited now as we were when we started in 1979. And I'm, I'm, I'm so excited about, I'm teaching children's church. Now, I, man, I remember Betty Howe, we, I'd go there and, and teach about Haiti and stuff in her children's church. I'm telling you, I love to get excited about the Bible stories. And these little kids, I have 65 in my children's church. And uh, we just got the nutritional center finished so we can bring them out of the big church and bring them over in the nutritional center. And they're so quiet. They just listen and listen. And I try to make my stories exciting because I think sometimes people just get up and read a Bible story. I don't like that. I want to make it exciting. I want them, when we get to Noah's Ark, I want them to moo like a cow. I want them to act like an ape. I want them to do every kind of animal. And we did that. I had 65 kids, and we did 65 animals, believe it or not. I love teaching God's Word. I love it. But I will have to tell you, I'm battle-born. I'm really battle-born. We've, we've had a bad year. Uh, July, we found out my daughter has a very horrible cancer. My baby girl that I carried in my stomach for nine months has um, gallbladder cancer, which is very deadly. And when we got that call, actually that day I felt like I needed to call her. You know how God gives you that feeling inside? And I felt like I needed to call her, so I called from Haiti. And she said, Mama, I was just wondering how I was going to get a hold of you. Mama, I've got cancer. 
and I just started bawling, we'll be there, we'll be there. And I'm telling you, by the next day, I was in Ohio. And I remember falling to my knees at that bed there in Haiti and just begging God, oh, God, don't let it be bad. Do a miracle, God, do a miracle. And Larry was sitting in the chair in the office, and I went in to tell him, and he kept saying, no, no, God's not going to do that. No, no, no. It's so difficult when it's your kid and you have that gut sickening feeling. Then after that, in October, we had two earthquakes. One was 12 miles from us, the core, and the other one was the next day, nine miles from us. I was in the bed both times. I was laying out some, some stuff that I was studying, and I couldn't get out, out of the bed. As I was moving, the bed was moving too. And I was trying to get out, and it just kept moving and moving. Larry, God love him, he was in that lift chair. And I don't know if you know anything about lift chairs, but you can't hardly get them things up very fast. And so me and him got out about the same time and ran outside. There was buildings going down across the street, 35 buildings back behind us, people screaming and crying. And I felt for the first time, they know what, they know that gut feeling. They know that gut sickening feeling of fear. And then, to top it all off, somebody runs over our dog. And I'm like, and I named him Kentucky. I started out naming him Duke for John Wayne, and they told me I can't name that dog Duke because Kentucky and Duke don't get along. So I had to switch to Kentucky. <laughs> Called him Tuck for short. But anyway, God, there's 365 scriptures about do not fear. But I want to tell you something. I'm battle-worn because every day when I would get fear for Lori, thinking, what if the medicine doesn't work? And for the people in Haiti who were sleeping, I had over 16 families sleeping on my porch and inside my house. And we had I don't know how many in our church and how many in our nutritional center. And I fed them. They come up every day, fed close to 100 little children, peanut butter and banana sandwiches every day. And they didn't want to go home. They were scared. You see, they had that gut sickening feeling. So I told God, I said, God, are you trying to tell me that all the times that I fuss at the Haitians, why they have to, when they become a Christian, keep one foot in the voodoo part and the other foot in the church? And I would stand up sometimes and get onto them. I was like, I know you went to a voodoo service last night. I know you were worshiping Satan. How can you do that? How can you be, be doing that when you accepted Jesus and was baptized? And they say, well, I have such a fear of Satan. And you know, then I realized, and God is showing me, they have that gut sickening feeling that if they don't give homage to Satan that he's going to put a curse on them. Nobody dies normal in Haiti. I don't care if you're 92 years old, you didn't die normal. Somebody put a curse on you. And so God is teaching me that scripture, fear not, I will help you. Fear not, he will reach out his righteous right arm, and I, he pulls me into him, and he holds me, and he says, fear not, I will help you. I will help you. So Larry always says when he leaves the platform, I'll tell you what I say to my wife, good luck to you. Well, when I'm leaving the platform, I'm going to say, fear not. Love you guys. Love you too. <laughs> You're good. That was dead on 10 minutes. There's a, there's a countdown clock up there. I mean, it went double zeros. When we hugged, that was incredible. So, yeah, their daughter is Lori Conley. I don't know if Lori's here. She may be here second service. I don't know. But uh, out in Claremont County, Empower Youth, some of you know who Lori is, but that's, that's their daughter. Lori and Scott, right, is her, her husband. All right, uh, Lynn and Ruby Johnston, come on up. Lynn and Ruby, um, they're from all over the world. I don't know where you call home, Canada maybe. I don't know. They don't have a home, they don't have a home just like Jesus. So, yeah. So we're connected with them through uh, Jeremiah House in Kyrgyzstan. That's a home, a residence for aged out orphan boys. And uh, so tell us what you want to tell us this morning. Thank you, Pastor. It's, first of all, I want to bring you greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good morning. 
And we're with, uh, or we are with, or we are LAM International. LAM stands for Leadership Activating Ministry. Our ministry is based on Ephesians 4.12. Anybody give me a quote on that? 4.12, it's about equipping of others. That's basically what we do. We equip others to be able to walk forward. Um, if I seem a little foggy, we arrived last night in Dayton at 10.30 from a week in Belarus, so it's not quite the same time. <laughs> We're working on it. Uh, but I really want to just talk a little bit about our ministry in Kyrgyzstan. In uh, Kyrgyzstan in particular, we have a, a, a two homes and some apartments where we focus on graduating orphans. And I just really want to acknowledge Parkside and their investment in that program that works with the children there. You may not realize it, but if you take 50, the orphans graduate at about age 15. They're given $100 and the clothes on their back. Bye. We have about six of the 15 that make it successfully into society. The other nine we lose to trafficking, prison, suicide, alcohol, drugs, the way the system is. There's no one to help them. So the program that we have there, we have homes, we can take these children in, and we can provide education for them, provide opportunities for them, and thanks to your investment, and I don't talk about giving. You give, but it's an investment in the future for these children. And I'm going to ask Ruby to talk. We've got some really fantastic stories of children that have come off the streets and that we've had for a number of years, and I'm going to let her explain a few of them. Great. Thank you. It's going to be fun, and I'm so excited to share these kids. And if we can go to the slide with uh, the next slide, please. And those are the countries we work in, 32 different countries. But the next slide, please. All right. These little ones here, first of all, I'm going to share a story with you. These are Zimbabwean children. And you know, when you share with those who work with vulnerable children, what's happening is it ignites their passion to help those kids survive and not be part of that lost group of orphans. These three little boys, HIV, went into a family in Zimbabwe that is a family from the church. They were not given much hope to do anything. They hadn't had education. With this family, this foster family that came forward from Zimbabwe, these little boys are thriving. They're doing well. They're, they are learning, and their numbers, HIV numbers, have dropped, 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 dropped. And the doctor says there's no reason they shouldn't be able to live a full, normal, healthy life. That's the church stepping in. This isn't a government problem of all these orphans and vulnerable children. It's a church problem. It is the heart of the believers. And when the believers step in, kids thrive, and they need those families. The next slide, if you'll go on to the next one, please. That, that um, we have a looking here, just kids that are part and parcel to being helped and needing you. In Kyrgyzstan in particular, when we look at Jeremiah House, I want to give you some stories. There are two young people I specifically want to talk about first, and they are Janabek and Aima. We have helped 17 uh, kids get reunited with their families, and many more than that get university educations. John Abeck was surrendered by his parents because of neglect, drug abuse, and lived and grew up in an orphanage. We had John Abeck come to Jeremiah House and live at Jeremiah House when he was still in school, finished school, we sent him to university, and last year he was on the dean's list. Every time the grades came out, he made the dean's list. Here's a young boy who had no dreams and no hope for the future, but yet still with love, with nurturing, and with discipleship, he began to see that there was a hope and a promise for him. He was a Jeremiah child. And in 
last year he applied for four different things. He applied to go to China for a short-term summer scholarship. He applied to go to Germany for a short-term summer scholarship. Pride applied for a leadership program in Kyrgyzstan to be one of the uh, traveling ambassador mentors and leaders. And he applied to come to the United States under the US Embassy to study at Indiana University in Evansville. John Abeck, got all four. He was awarded all four of them, and he had to make a choice. He chose Go the, ahead, go ahead and change that the, slide. Um, he chose the um, uh, leadership, and he chose the university in Indiana. Right now, as we speak, John Abeck is in Evansville, Indiana, for one year on a scholarship from the U.S. Embassy, and this is a young man who had no hope. He wasn't going anywhere. He was going down, 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 downhill. But something, and it was God, grabbed his heart, and he began to see his promise in Jeremiah. Another young girl who was thrown away by her mother when she was young, her name is Aima, and she was in our Jeremiah project as well. And when she came, she was lost. She had no one. She was by herself. And she came into the Jeremiah house, the Jeremiah Steps program, and went through education, began to grow and to develop, and she graduated from university this last year out of the Jeremiah program. And out of university graduating, she said, I don't know for sure what I want to do, but in the back of my mind, I've been thinking about maybe I could be a flight attendant. I said, Aima, it's wonderful. You have to apply. So she applied for Emirates, and she fly applied for Qatar. And she got interviews for both. Unbelievable. When she went to uh, Emirates, she said, I really want to work for Emirates because it's the best airline in the whole world. And it's very difficult to become an airline flight attendant for that airline. Not only did she get the interview, but she got the second interview. She got the third. And right now, she has just finished her training in Dubai. And she is on an airplane somewhere. And she's flying around, and she has met her dreams. God has raised her up, and he has come back to fulfill that promise that you are a future and a hope. You're not lost. You might have been an orphan and a vulnerable person coming from a hard place. You might have had abuses that we can't even speak about in public that wouldn't be fair to her. But you are ashes to beauty. And this is what it's all about, Snajana, ward after ward. And it's not just about all the things that the kids that are good. It's about the Jeremiah promise. And you know, church, we just thank you because without you, we can't do anything that we do. And it's not just the finances, thank you very much. It is the prayer. It is the dark of the night when we're on our knees and we're crying out and we feel like we're all alone in some country somewhere in the world that we know it is our prayer partner back here that really sustains us. That's what you've done for us, and we thank you. We thank you from the bottom of our heart. We cannot do this without you. By the way, Larry, I'm 72, and he's 76, so we are just a bunch of old fogies up here on this stage. I love it. I love it. Hallelujah, you bet, Pastor. <clears throat> Uh, I'll just, uh, if, if you go by our booth out there, we've got a little brochure that would tell you a little bit more if you want to read up on it. And I just want to make sure that you understand this is not about Lynn and Ruby. This is about Jesus. He does it all. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Pino. This is Pino Nelia. And uh, he's a good deal for us. He, we, he's a two-for-one deal because not only... Do we have a missionary in Italy, but we also get Albania as a part of the deal. He sails across the sea and does work there as well. So, thank you. let us have it, brother. I need to do a new picture because I don't have a mustache anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you love me. I know. This was my, my church, Mount Washington Church of Christ. Uh, we are talking dinosaurs time. But I know also that you love me for one other reason. Can you turn a look at that clock? 1707. Can you see? You have an Italian time. 
you have the Italian time, guys, for the reason every time you remember Italy, okay? Oh, a good preacher should have the Bible anytime. I have my Bible. It's here. It's not a watch. It's not a uh, phone. And I use a verse of the Bible. Hebrew 13, 24. Those from Italy send to you greetings. It's in the Bible. <laughs> yes. Greetings. Ciao. Can you say ciao? Ciao. Oh, great. Great. <laughs> you know, one of the work that I'm doing right now is to recruit new people to come in Italy to work. Now you learn the first word in Italian, you are able to come in Italy, okay? <laughs> now, what we are doing, we are doing to the glory of God. Amen. First of all, we are working in Italy. Uh, the Lecce Christian Mission come from the town, this Lecce. Lecce is a, a city straight in the southeast of Italy. It is um, an important city because uh, not for the population, we have only 120,000 people. It's not a big deal for Europe. But has the second largest university in the state of Puglia with 55,000 students. Uh, yes, uh, Italy is a 60 million people in a state of the size of Nevada. We are urban life. Eh? Just a millionaire can have a, a single home like you Americans. <laughs> Impossible. But the name of the mission comes from that town. But my work is not just in Lecce. I'm going around in all the churches in Italy that they call me for revival, for um, also uh, workshop, and more teaching. I'm a more teaching. And what I'm doing is leadership training. That is one of the most biggest work that I'm doing. And uh, anything that we have in Italy, we print. We translate from English or we write in straight in Italian, okay? And I was glad to, to hear uh, just a little French right now. Ah, sad. <laughs> Gorgeous. <laughs> anyway, in the kingdom of God, we don't go to retirement. Huh? But I don't want to lose the time. You Americans, you are really sensible to the time. <laughs> <laughs> now, and also what we are doing, we are doing a big, huge convention of the Church of Christ Christian Church. Every year, if you want to spend a vacation in the middle of June, come and you will enjoy these beautiful beaches that we have around in the uh, area of Lecce. But more of that, you will meet all the leaders of the Church of Christ around all Italy. Middle of June, remember that. Now, Bart told you, in 91, we started this work in Albania. I never planned to be an evangelist outside of Italy. Never, never. And that recalled me also the Bible. Many times, sometimes, you will see that Paul, he didn't think that he wanted to go in some place. But the Spirit sent him. And we come back again. Oh, we are preacher. We need to use the Bible. And Romans, look, Romans 15, 19. So, from Jerusalem to Illyricum. It's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. And you know what is a... Illyricum, Illyricum is Albania. <laughs> and we come back again in the area where the apostles preach. And uh, it was neat. In 91, thousands of refugees arrived in the coast of Lecce. I started to work in the, in the refugees camp. After a while, we put a print advertising in the most popular newspaper in Albania. And we receive over 1,300 letters that they ask for Bible, a Bible course for correspondence. From that, we start to go, to go, we start to go, because we are the Air Force of Christ. We are just the pilots, but you are so important. You are in the base. Hey, you are in the base. You are our base. Okay? But we went in Albania. Right now, what we have? We have two ministers full-time that work in Albania, and we have five churches. We have, when I'm talking five churches, I'm talking ch uh, Christian Church of Christ. 
and uh, that they work and they witness Jesus Christ in Albania. In 2005, this church we birthed, we started a program. He was the first that came in Albania in 2005 for a program of VBS. You remember? Oh, yeah. Ah, gorgeous. And uh, <laughs> it's a fantastic program. Think that in 97, we had our record in one church, only one church, Gostima. We had uh, 93 kids. And uh, what is fantastic about that number? I don't like numbers. But what was fantastic about that number is that Gostima is in the Muslim district. All that 93 kids, they were Muslims. And we share the story of Jesus Christ and the Word of God to all these kids. And we, will continue, and we continue to do that. Fantastic. Praise the Lord. 70% of the Albanians are Muslims. 20% are Orthodox and 10% are Catholics. Also, important thing, the pride. Sometimes, Tony, we need to have just a little pride. Come on. <laughs> Forgive me about that. Okay. The Church of Christ Christian Church in Albania is recognized from the state. Not many denominations has that. And we really, we are thank to God that we make three applications and two times they refuse to give a recognize. Now we are recognized from the state. That wants you mean that we can operate, operate inside of Albania. We can own no property, all that kind of stuff. And that is really important. A small mission, really small, not a big deal. But praise the Lord God, we were able to make that success. Oh, the success. Hmm. Sometimes the pride, Tony, is a sin. Yes, it's a sin. I know that. But... We need to forget, don't forget that anything that we are doing, we're doing to the glory of God, like what I hear before, to the glory of God. He used us like a humble servant. And anything that happened is because God make the seed grow. It's in the Bible also, huh? <laughs> it's in the Bible. It's God that make the seed grow. Thank you, guys, for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Thank you for everything. Like many times, the Apostle Paul wrote his letters to say thank you. One of the best letters to say thank you was to the Philippians. Oh, your prayers, your support, your love is a perfume for us. Thank you very much. Together, together. Together, we will be useful for the growth of the kingdom of God in Italy, in Albania, in everywhere where all our brothers, they are working. Everywhere, everywhere. God bless you, brothers. You. And next up is Earl Hobner. Earl is with uh, Central Brazil Mission and... Uh, has been in Goiânia for many years, but now he is all about the Amazon River. And so, Earl, tell us what you'd like us to know okay. this morning. Aquele que é poderoso para fazer infinitamente mais do que tudo quanto pedimos ou pensamos, conforme seu poder que opera em nós. A ele seja glória na igreja em Cristo Jesus por todas as gerações, para todos sempre. Amém. That was Ephesians 3.20. That God can do immeasurably more than all you ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in you. Now, many of you don't know me, but Ruth Ann and I, I don't know what's going to happen up there. Oh, there's some up there, okay. Ruth Ann and I were in the first grade together in Georgetown, Ohio. And we have been in Brazil July of next year, 50 years. And we'll be married... And we will be married 60 years next year. God has been good to us, and our children now are ready to take over. And I already told them it will be 20 years yet before you can take over. So we went to Brazil and went as a church planner. 
And I started a little church in March of 1974 in Goyanya, a city of 350,000 at the time. Today, there's about 2 million people that live in Goyanya. Our mission statement is make disciples, make better disciples, you'll make more disciples. And that is our job, discipleship one-on-one. -on -one. So we started the church in March of 74. And then in 1979, we had a church growth conference with Don McGavern, Peter Wagner in Brazil. And I changed my life. I learned something there. The need to dream. Don McGavern said, where do you want to be 10 years from now? Where do you want to be 20 years from now? You need to have a vision. You need to dream. Let God do something with you. And let me say this to you. If you don't dream, if you don't have a vision of what God wants, five years are going to go by, 10 years are going to go by, 20 years are going to go by, and you'll never discover what God might have done with you. And so after that conference in 1979, in 1980, we set goals for 1990, 10-year goals. How many churches we wanted, how many Christians we wanted. When 1990 came, we had surpassed all those goals. Leadership training. All of our preachers, their main job is to be training somebody to take his job. So when you go start a new church, you don't go look for a preacher. You have trained up preachers. And so in 1990, we set goals for 2000. When 2000 came, all of those goals had surpassed. From that one church that we started in March of 1974, that church has produced 80 to 100 churches. When we completed 40 years in Brazil, we had baptized through that one church and their multiplication of churches 40,000 individuals in 40 years. And they continued to grow. And so in the 90s, the Brazilian church became a missionary church. The, the Brazilian church, Brazilians can go any place. There's no country in the world that's anti-Brazilian. And so we have taken advantage of that, and we have mi Brazilian missionaries in the five Portuguese-speaking countries. In Africa, we have, we have Brazilian missionaries all over. So God decided, Hubner, what are you doing here? You have these churches you started, and they're on their own. They're all self-supporting indigenous churches. What are you doing here? They don't need you anymore. And so in 19, October of 94, we had a missionary conference in this mother church that we had started. We wanted to become a missionary church. God, we want to do something. And we fasted and we prayed and the whole month of October. For one week went by, two weeks went by, three weeks went by. The beginning of the first week, I get a call from a guy that I had known in Guayana years earlier. Now he's married, living in Manaus. Manaus is the capital of the state of Amazonas right in the middle of the rainforest of Brazil. He says, I'm married now. I married an Argentina gal, and we're going to Argentina, and I've got about 10 people in this church, and we have decided we want, they want you to come and take over the church. Well, the only thing I knew about Manaus at, at that time, the way to get back to the United States, was go from Guayana to Brasilia, to Manaus, to Caracas, then to Miami, and that was our flight pattern. So there was one, one of these flights back. It was 6 o'clock in the morning, and we were at the airport in Manaus, and I stepped off the back of the plane as people got off and on. And it was a, probably 100 degrees, because it's one degree south of the equator. It was 100 degrees, and the humidity was about the same. And I thought to myself, who in the world would ever want to live or work here? Never let God even know you think things like that. Because <laughs> he may have something different. <clears throat> January 25th, 1995, I flew to Manaus with this couple and their three kids, and we took over this little church. The church started growing. They have multiplied five times now in, in Manaus itself. But after a couple of years, Pastor Geraldo said, Pastor Francisco, and that's what I'm calling Brazil, because Brazilians cannot say Earl. They would say, oh! <laughs> and I can't have people bark at me, so my middle name is Francis. I am called Pastor Francisco. He calls me, he says, Pastor Francisco, he said, if we're going to have a good work in the Amazon, we need a boat. I said, okay, who knows? Maybe God wants us to have a boat. So we started praying, and I, I can't go through all the miracles that took place when we got our first boat. That was the first boat over there. And we used that boat from March of 2000 to the end of 2011. 
We have visited 70-some villages, and we have 20-some churches now in these villages in the Amazon. We are producing Amazon missionaries, not American missionaries. Amazon, we can't even produce Goiania missionaries in the Amazon. You have to have Amazon missionaries, people that live there. We are producing uh, Amazon missionaries. And so we have 20-some churches. We have visited maybe 70 villages. We continue. We do a trip a month. Well, we do more than that because between February and October, we will do 12 to 15 10-day trips. When Ruth Ann and I came back at the end of October just now, we had been on the boat seven weeks. We had four trips back to back to back to back visiting different areas. But in the state of Amazonas alone, and that is only one Sixth of the land area of Brazil, just the state of Amazonas, half of the rainforest of Brazil, there are 30,000 villages. And the only way to reach them is by water. So that's why we do all these trips. And it is a different world. It is a different world. You would not believe. When we first started, we went to villages where kids had never, never taken a bath. They had no idea what soap was. For them to get in a bath was to get in a river and get out of the river. They had worms. They had so many worms, the worms come out their neck, out under their arm, worms all over, just full of worms. And so our main, when we first started, our main objective was worm medicine and vitamins, and we still do that. We still do that. And I remember this one little boy. I'll never forget this. One of the first villages, and you have a, a, a ladder that comes from the water up to the village. And so I was sitting on the steps. This little boy had never, been, never had a bath. So I had a sponge and soap, and I was scrubbing him. We were sitting in the water, and a layer of dirt came off, and another layer of dirt came off. And he looked up at me, and he says, and I'm going to look like you, aren't I? (laughs) Well, he never did. And so, but that's what we're doing. And we will treat on a trip anywhere from 400 to 600 individuals every trip. We have a full-time Brazilian dentist now. We are paying to have a full-time Brazilian doctor. She is in her second year of medical school now. To, to, in the future, this will all, it'll come Brazilian, but it's all, it'll simply be a mission work. That's the Portuguese word in there, wasn't it? It'll always be a... a. And so in, in January of 2000, we inaugurated the new boat. You and other churches raised a million dollars to build a hospital boat. We never one time worried about the expense. And we built it. We designed the boat. We bought three welding machines, and our crew on the boat built that boat. And you want a life-changing experience. Greg Maxey and uh, Bill Janke, isn't it? They're going to come. They're scheduled to come in April of 21. We are booking trips now for 22, 2022. We do 12 to 15 trips a year. One example of how some of these villages are. We have a missionary in one of the villages. I still have time, don't I? A minute and a half. Oh. Just one example. We were at this one village where we have a, a missionary. And he says, Pastor Francisco, there's a village on back there that we need to go to, but they're strange. The people are different. So we, we better not go right now. I said, okay. So as we treated at their village, these people in this other village came by. And so they came on the boat. They wanted to see what we were doing. And so they came on, and everybody comes on the boat, has a file card, you, you, you treat them. And, but they wouldn't look at you. They came in the doctor's office. They wouldn't, wouldn't look. But after a couple of trips, they said, why don't you come back to our village? Well, that's what we wanted. And so one of the trips, uh, Gilberto went with us because it's like the Everglades back through the, the swamp to this other village. Very poor. This young lady came on the boat. She had a baby that was six months old and weighed six pounds. It was just like a Raggedy Ann doll. She had no breast. She had no milk. They had no food in the village. And we had formula on the boat. And Ruth Ann fixed formula, and we gave it to that little girl. And we, we, we thought that's the least we can do. That little boy today is six years old. His arms, when you hold him by, it's like a broomstick. And his legs, but he can walk. He can kick a soccer ball, and we have a church in that village that didn't even want us to come near there. To show you the kind of people in that village and what we face, 
the leader of the village, when we were there the last time, had nine kids. His oldest was 12, and she was pregnant. And that's the way it is in the villages. But God has been good to us, people like you that come. And, and by the way, you have supported us since 52 years ago when we started raising our support. Ruth and I are both from Georgetown, Ohio, way out here and going to Brazil. You, you can't believe it. I couldn't even speak Kentuckian and had to learn to speak Portuguese. <laughs> and we went, and you have been a part. Many of you have known us for, since we were little kids. And you've been a part of our ministry ever since. And so God bless you. Uh, we're excited. We don't plan to stop. People say, what are you going to do when you retire? I am retired now, and I'm retired on the boat. And as long as we can go, we're going to go. Thank you. This is Tom Sears. He's with take, uh, Training Christians for Ministry. It used to be uh, Toronto Christian Mission. Mm-hmm. Back in the day with Gene Doolin, and uh, wow, what a history of that organization. <laughs> Tony's going to come up here and join me as well. But several years ago, TCM adopted a new vision statement that every nation will have effective leaders of disciple making movements impacting their churches, cultures, and countries for Christ. All of you that may know about TCM know that through our history, working through Eastern Europe and Central Asia and over 40 different countries now, we have students and graduates serving in their home nations in ministry. And now with a a vision that encompasses every nation, we began asking the question and realizing, you know what? I think the United States is indeed part of every nation. And so through praying and fasting, the Lord has opened up doors for us to extend our ministry from the 40 places that we work and expand that also to the United States. So currently in Indianapolis and also in several other cities soon to follow, we're taking our master's level ministry training courses, walking alongside of churches here in the States and helping better equip the pastors, lay leaders, and elders to be more effective in ministry. Over the years, we've raised up faculty teaching in these different nations. The faculty come from over 12 different countries. And when we asked them, would you be willing to come also to the United States and help train Americans for ministry? You know what they said? They said, the Americans have been so good to us. If we can come and be a blessing to them, it would be our honor. Those are the type of people that we want teaching for us. So that together, we can add the United States to the TCM map and raise up more leaders of disciple-making movements in the 40-plus nations we work and here in the United States. Tony? Hasn't this been great to hear all these stories? And you know, being part of God's global family is such a privilege. Wednesday night, when we had our little family reunion here, I think I can speak on behalf of all of us. We felt so included, so loved, so encouraged, worshiping together, and it was just a delight to be here. An underlining theme behind all the stories here, as well as TCM's story, is prayer and fasting. TCM started 61 years ago in answer to prayers, prayers of babushkas, prayers of people in the East who in many cases felt like they didn't have a prayer. They prayed for Bibles for medicine, for good literature, for antibiotics to keep their pastor alive because the government wouldn't allow them to have it. And Gene Doolin, uh, working in Toronto, Toronto Christian Mission at that time, church planning organization, felt the call and an answer to those prayers and began working behind the Iron Curtain. Over the years, that ministry just quietly grew and grew and grew. 
1971, uh, an old derelict hunting lodge was purchased just south of Vienna, Austria, to help equip those leaders. And then in 1989, we all know what happened. The Berlin Wall imploded. I believe in answer to the prayers of suffering people who wanted a change from being imprisoned by that system. And I think God's people prayed that wall down. I came on board at that time, and I'll tell you a secret. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. But I did meet people who taught me so much about prayer and fasting. So we just thought, okay, it's worked thus far. Let's just continue with that philosophy. So we started praying and saying, Lord, what do we do? And we asked people in the East to pray, Lord, what do we do? There were 3,000 contacts and our names in our files that we began uh, talking with and saying, what do we do? And almost to a person in one voice, they said, train us. But because we'd been conditioned by communism, we didn't know what that meant. So we said, okay, uh, how do we get it to you so that nobody gets arrested? <laughs> How do we, uh, uh, what kind of training, what you need? So what they basically said to us, it needs to be affordable, accessible, accredited, disciple-making focused, full of prayer, and it, and it needs to be, you know, just as high a level as possible because I have a PhD from Moscow State in physics. I don't need a bachelor's degree. I want some letters after my name that are going to help me to build a, a, a Bible college or a seminary or a not-for-profit or whatever I need. So they wanted to be higher capacity leaders because those were the natural leaders under communism. So we just started with a couple of people. We started a little master's program. We were able to get it accredited here in the United States with the university accrediting, the Higher Learning Commission that accredits the schools here in Ohio, the, uh, University of Cincinnati and, and the schools here. So we, we were able to get it accredited in a way that would help them building what they needed to build vis-a-vis -vis their governments, all in answer to prayer. We were the only institution they ever accredited that worked totally out the United States. And if I had time, I'd tell you the miracle that allowed that to happen. But it was an answer to prayer. All through the years, we just have continued that philosophy of just taking everything to the Lord in prayer. Today, as Tom said, we're working in lots of countries. We've extended because of the vision. We're now looking at some places in Africa, Middle East, and what people are telling us there are 650 disciple-making movements globally. And as we engage with people in those movements, what they're telling us is we need exactly what those communist, post-communist people told you they needed. We need a way to, to raise up uh, laborers for the harvest, but people who know how to train other laborers for the harvest and who can have credentialing that gets them where they need to go. We're not about really degrees. We're not about credentialing. We're about passports. And what we found is that because our degrees have been recognized by the government in Russia or Ukraine or Moldova or Romania or more recently in Turkey, because our degrees uh, are, are able to be recognized, it gives them status they couldn't have. 18 Turkey students with the House Edelweiss when word came through that the government had recognized their degrees. They were like young Turks on fire. I mean, you, you would not believe the passion that they had. They started immediately talking about what they could build, what they could do, and how excited they were to actually have status in their country with just a few thousand believers in their country to have some status. God can do things like this. 
He does it in answer to prayer and to fasting. The prayers of Parkside all through the years have been part of making things like this happen. People around the world right now are praying for us. All of these countries, they are praying for America. First of all, they're grateful for what places like Parkside have done all through the ages, all through the years. But they also are concerned about our country. So they are praying for us. So let's join them in praying for America as well, that God would be able to do a work here because we can still be a blessing to the world if, if this country, if we would turn and repent and begin to rely on the Lord and prast and prasting and fair. <laughs> so thank you. God bless you. And on behalf of all of us here, we just want to tell you that, again, that we love you and we're grateful to you. And you have blessed so many around the world. And together, let's try to bless this country now as well with what we need to continue serving globally. Amen. Thank you. You may be wondering, what, what can we do right now in response to all of this? And uh, we're going we're gonna to receive an offering. <laughs> And uh, all of the money that is given today will go in support of our 26 mission partners and uh, everything that they're about, unless you designate it otherwise. That's where all the money goes today. So, yes, we're hoping to uh, lift a big one and uh, next service as well. But thank you all. Uh, wow, you did such a wonderful job expressing your heart and uh, just making yourselves known to us in such a winsome way. Uh, it's, it's such an honor to have you here. So uh, I will pray, and then we'll, we'll take the offering. God, I thank you for uh, these good friends, these partners in ministry, and I pray that you would um, take these gifts that are being offered right now and just translate these dollars into changed lives, um, into meeting physical needs where that is the need, and, but more importantly, the greatest need that everyone has, and that is the need to know of Christ and his ability to save lives and change lives. And so use these dollars. Help us to be the very best stewards of these dollars as they are given in your honor right now. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.